uh, genetically altered seeds, uh, genetically altered uh, animals uh, that we're using for either militaristic purposes. That, you know, we now have goats that create spider silk in their milk so that the military can harvest that for creating these new bulletproof vests that are as light as a T-shirt, but they'll stop a bullet because they're incredibly strong, that sort of thing. Wow. We also we also see some of the human applications that are happening in the genetic revolution where you have designer babies right now already being created uh, in um, in the laboratories out of the United Kingdom. Uh, where you can you can use sex selection, eye color, that sort of thing. Um, we also see that there's a business application to the genetics revolution, and big business, uh, huge corporations, are investing billions of dollars uh, into the future of genetic modification and 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 biotechnology because everything from what we might talk about later, everything from transhumanist applications to what, what, what's really more on the forefront right now, and that is the patenting of certain genetic application for providing medicines that might uh, cure people who have a certain kind of genome, or I mean a certain type of gene type, or that have, let's say, diabetes or whatever. And these huge corporations know that they'll be able to create these, these medical applications that may provide cures for people who have a certain gene type uh, but if they own the if they own the the um, the patent on that gene type, which they're doing right now, the people who want the cure are going to have to pay the dollar. So it's it, we're we're talking about really the next uh, the next revolution, if you. But but now in gen- genetics revolution, and this is the issue I think that's really more important to me, and it's what I talk about more, more than anything else, are the ethics involved in the genetics revolution. I mean, in other words, if people of faith or even people of concern, what do they have to say and what are their concerns about this newfound knowledge? In other words, how is it going to impact us on a practical day-to-day level? How is it going to impact our children? How is it going to impact the future? How will it impact the environment, the balance of nature? How will it infect our health and resources? And that's, and I think that's the subject matter where people of faith can get involved mm-hmm. in this debate uh, because the ethics of biotechnology and the genetics revolution is, is going to, if not already has started, is going to touch the lives of every human on planet Earth. So it's time for the church to be engaged in this debate in very profound ways. And Tom, uh, speaking of this ethics debate, there's been a few statements made from within the religious community that just totally shocked me. Uh, one of them was from the Catholic Church in Britain, and you correct me if I'm wrong because you're you're more up to date than I. But I, I think they actually said that if any women who they've discussed actually uh, carrying uh, in in their own womb a chimera, uh, which we'll we'll talk about later, are an animal human hybrid, animal human genetic hybrid, that if they were actually um, you know put in their womb one of these uh, entities that they said that they should carry them to term and that they should not be destroyed, but they should go on and be birthed. And, and all sorts of other stranger things like this. If, if I got my story straight, and there's... No, that's exactly right. The, there were two... And this was during the whole discussion in the U.K., maybe, oh, 45 days ago, two months ago now, uh, when, when this debate was heating up, you had Catholic bishops from England and Wales who um, and 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 their uh, their submission was actually in writing, um, and what they said was that human animal embryos that are conceived in the laboratory in this way. This was during the debate phase. These so-called chimeras that they first of all they ought to be regarded as human because that if they even had even a preponderance of human genes, then they had to be assumed to be embryonic human beings at least in part. That was one of the points they were making. And they said uh, that if mothers participated in the providing of ovum or whatever for the creation of these exotic creatures, then and, and if they decided they wanted to bring these babies to term and have them as children, they ought to have the right to do that, to give birth to them. This, th- these were the Catholic bishops of England and Wales, and, it was in, and anybody can go look this up at Google or Yahoo and read their submission to the um, parliamentary joint committee that was scrutinizing that draft legislation. And they said that these genetic mothers of these chimeras ought to be able to raise these children if they wanted to. Now, there were other following that, 
uh, in fact, following after I went on radio and brought it out and had people go and read it, then there were some Catholics uh, that came along and said they did not agree with these bishops of England and Wales. But it illustrates what kind of tortured ethical debate are being raised um, by these issues, and you and you really do have to understand that that these that these bishops. Uh, who were advocating for this? Th- these are not uh, these are not people who are you know on the fringe. These are not people who are without reason capacities. They were they were actually making a reasonable statement that if these things are part human, you can't just simply kill them at 14 days. I mean, ethically, the church has to have a position that human life has a value. But 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 the big problem is we don't know what these things are. That yeah, they may be part human, but but they're not entirely human therefore it staggers the mind uh what kind of proposition is being made here right and of the, course the religious community has to wonder do they have a soul and are they uh, subject to salvation or even the fall and then the uh, secular community has to worry about do they have human rights and what kind of laws and jurisdiction do they fall under that's exactly right, and, and 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 what's interesting is different religions handle it differently. I mean, I've read some of the mm. stuff that's written by some of the the priests um, uh, out of Israel, and some of their scholars are are saying that they're not sure that these human animal chimeras would have a soul. And one of their one of their priests actually said, therefore, would it be okay to sacrifice one of them as a sac- as a blood sacrifice? I mean, it was just. So, so here you go. I mean, there's really no way to answer the dilemma that's being presented by what we're doing now in science, but we're doing it anyway. And this is why I was interested in going back into the past. And, uh, you know, I started out trying to find what some of the models might be, um, it, it, just the scientific models, what might be the benefits, what mm-hmm. might be uh, the dangers, the risks associated with the crossing over of the species barriers, not just humans and not just animals, even plant life, uh, because, you know, having been a pastor for so many years, I actually earned, by the way, an honorary doctorate for my studies in this area. You know, my, my interest in this was if, if it is God who put in place barriers between the species so that a dog cannot normally mate with a pig and, pr- and produce a dog pig or a pig dog or whatever, um, why would God have put these barriers in place so that humans can't breed with animals and that sort of thing? Uh, what what does God know that we don't know? So I, I started out, you know, with with that kind of a passion to understand this, but I also wanted to um, advocate just for the scientific reasoning behind all of it. You know, what were the benefits? What might be the negatives? And the interesting thing was I wasn't finding anything hmm. uh, in science models. And, and when I say I wasn't finding anything in science models, this was maybe 15 or 16, 17 years ago when most people didn't even understand the term transgenics or biotechnology or transhumanism. Um, and I wasn't finding anything in the science community, but I kept finding this old story where this had happened once before. And this was what mm. astonished me, that around the world there was a universal record, and it was the oldest record in human history. It, it, it's right in the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis chapter 6, and it's in the beginning of the Sumerian legends, the Egyptian legends, the Greek legends, the Chinese legends. Over and over, I found around the world, one of the very first stories ever told was a story about how these gods came down, and they mingled human and animal DNA for the purposes of creating a body into which they could extend themselves. And this led to chaos, and, and, and in the Bible, of course, ultimately it led to the fiat of the Great Flood. But, the, but this universal story stood out to me, that there was this warning. And you know the old saying that people who can't learn from the past are danged, that's not the word, but <laughs> danged to repeat it. Um, it you know, I, I started wondering, you know, I think we have the, much of this mythos where Zeus, um, comes down, and he mates with a human female, and out of that is born Hercules. But, th- th- but this story was told even in the sacred books, even books associated with the Bible. It was told over and over again uh, how these things came down. And, and so I, you know, I started seeing a mirror 
of what had happened in ancient time with what we're doing today, the blending of humans and animals. And scientists, by the way, now, uh, even this week I read some of the people who were involved in this debate in Australia uh, were saying that ultimately, behind closed doors, ultimately scientists are saying that these beings won't be destroyed at 14 days. Ultimately, some of them are going to be raised to full maturity. And this is, this is the gateway now that we're opening. Well, it's just like with uh, weapon systems. You know, mankind has never invented a weapon they didn't eventually use. And the same thing is true in every other area of science, too. Any kind of uh, discovery in biology or other kind of fields is eventually going to be taken to its full measure because that's just the innate curiosity, whatever it is, innate in mankind, desire to be God, whatever. We've had our ethicists warn about it. But right now they finally have the tools in their pocket it reminds me of the Tower of Babel, you know, when, when God said, if, if we don't intervene, there's nothing that man can't right. do. And now he really has the tools today to go to the fundamental nature of, of creation and to take the fundamental building blocks. Now, he can't speak nothing that's in existence like God, but he can take the fundamental building blocks here and, and virtually create whatever he pleases. No, you are you are exactly right. And so think about, well, first think of the ancient record, and then secondly think of the modern record. The ancient record, these beings, for whatever reason, needed to blend species. And if we have time tonight, we can talk about why I think they needed to do that. But they needed to blend animals and humans, and they made a body. And this is in the this is in the not just the book of Genesis. Uh, it's also in the New Testament, the book the book of Jude, the, the epistles of Peter, where their reasons for doing this was they wanted to leave their estate. They wanted to leave their plane of existence. They wanted to come down into our reality. And for whatever reason, that required them to create a body. Now, they could have came down in the days of, of Jared uh, on the mountain of Horeb, uh, according to the story. They could have came down any time they wanted to and possessed people. Uh, but they didn't want to possess people. They didn't want to just house themselves in somebody else's body. They wanted to be incarnated. They wanted to enter our reality. And, and, and the way they did that was by creating a body through which they could extend themselves and, and all these records, I mean, if you look at the, the ancient book of Jasher, which is a book that's uh, it's referred to in the Bible, in the book of Joshua 10, 13, it's talked about in 2 Samuel 1, 18, and, and, it, and it's so important, that this text, because it says, it says, after the fallen angels went into the daughters of men, then the sons of men taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order to provoke the Lord. Now, this so, book of Jasher you mentioned, that's a book that's actually cited in our regular canon of the Bible itself, correct? It is. It's referred to in the book of, in the, uh, in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, the 10th chapter, verse 13. It's also referred to in 2 Samuel 1.18. It also was part of the canon that Jesus and his disciples used. This was a book hmm. that was not excluded from the canon of Scripture until many years later, uh, during, I think, the Second Council of Trent, where they were trying to determine uh, which books they could, with some level of um, certainty, determine who the authors of the books were, and where they couldn't determine the authors of the book, uh, then they excluded them from the canon. But for many years, mm -hmm. they continued to publish these apocryphal or pseudepigrapha books as uh, secondary, you know, like Maccabees and 3rd and 4th Daniel mm -hmm. and other books, they, they continued to include those uh, in versions of the book of the Bible, but it was only right. uh, many, many years later where they just started publishing the canon that we use now. Well, but, I, but the I, did, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, Tom, but what I make clear to my listeners as you proceed further with your hypothesis here is that what you're going to lay out here is not dependent upon these other books. To it's justify not. it, you can read it directly out of the words of... Uh, Genesis chapter 6, and if you're very, very careful in taking your, your Hebrew translation, if, uh, if, if people have questions here, you can go to blueletterbible.org online or go some, to your other references and look up the Hebrew words and look up what you're sharing. But the core of this is directly out of Scripture, what you're sharing. And actually, 
rather than confusing scripture, it clarifies a lot of scripture. We talked a little bit about this with the Gilberts when they were on, uh, but, but what you're going to share, just taking our regular canon we have, it's clearly denoted in there, and these other references you're citing are ones that are, are referenced in the Bible or were used by people at the time of the writing of the Bible, and all they do is really add further elaboration and further testimony that collaborates with other external records of other cultures that puts together a common story.